All right, so um, we are now going to move on to uh, more of a fireside chat than a talk. Um, most of you um, will have received in your goodies bag when you arrived here a book called 100 Plus, which has just come out and is written by Sonia Arison, who is about to join me on stage. Those of you who did not receive it because we ran out, because his uh, publishers didn't send enough, I have been told, uh, reliably, that we can get them for you. So please e simply email me to give me your mailing address and we will make it happen. That's the first important thing I want to say. Uh, but this book is totally fantastic. It's, it's more or less the book that I was thinking of writing next, and so I'm delighted that I don't have to. Um, <coughs> and so I'd like to, to invite Sonia up to the stage, please. Um, uh, So Sonia's book is not a repeat by any means of the book that many of you know I wrote with my um, research assistant Michael Ray four years ago. That book was Ending Aging. It was about the science, or it was predominantly about the science of the um, extension of life and the postponement of age-related ill health. Sonia deals predominantly with the social context of all of this. And I think that we've been overdue a book like that for some time, so I'm extremely happy that someone as prominent as Sonia has done this. Sonia is a very well-respected commentator on many areas in technology, and it's a real delight that she is sufficiently interested in and committed to doing something about ageing that she's taken the trouble to actually write a whole book about it. So I'm delighted to have her up here. Um, so I think the question I'd like to start with is, what is it about? everyone out there. What do you think it is that makes people so willing to capitulate and make their peace with aging? Well, you know, Aubrey, I think, uh, you know, I've thought about that a lot, actually, over the last couple of years as I've been writing the book, and I think you actually hit it on the head. I've, I've appropriated one of your, one of the things that you've come up with, it's the idea of this pro-death trance that, um, you know, through, uh, human, we've always learned since the beginning of time, really, that humans die. And there's a lot of anxiety about that. And uh, we have different ways to deal with that anxiety. And one way is to convince ourselves that death is good, that de death is natural. We should embrace death. Um, and because that view is so ingrained in culture, in our culture, um, we, we, it's really tough to escape it. You know, I think Nick, Nick Bostrom also had a really good way of putting it. Uh, he said something like, you know, it's, it's like we're, we're in this, we're stuck in this Stockholm syndrome where, you know, people start to really relate to their captors and start to love their captors. And in some way, some people have begun to love death because they think they can't escape it. But, you know, I think I love being at conferences like this and meeting the type of people who are here because I think there, there's a possibility that we can escape what's been our fate for so long. And I think we should try. And so all of you really are my heroes. So uh, thank you. So, so a slightly more personal version of the same question. Um, does, it, does it depress you that people are so hard to convince that aging is actually something we ought to do something about? It doesn't depress me. It annoys me. Because I just don't understand why they can't see that there's a possibility that they could not only live longer but be healthier. I mean, who doesn't want to be healthier? That seems crazy to me. That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course I agree completely. Um, uh, uh, I mean, what is going on? Um, but yeah, I, I, just like you, I've spent obviously many years trying to convince the general public that actually what we want to do here in terms of keeping people healthy is just regular medicine taken forward in a, in a manner that appears to comply with everything that we say we think. You know, most... Hands up anyone in the audience who would identify themselves as ageist. That was easy. Okay. So if old people are people too, then it sort of, you know. Um, so um, from a methodological point of view, a, a tactical point of view, um, what's your elevator pitch? When you meet someone in the elevator, for example, right. and you find out that they are 
in favour of ageing, or at least they're not in favour of doing anything about ageing, what is your, like, 30-second um, attempt to change their mind? Well, it all depends on how they say they're against um, health extension. And so if they say something like, well, oh, I wouldn't want to live longer, I say, why? And they say, oh, well, because I don't want to be old and decrepit. Oh, no, no, you wouldn't be old and decrepit because we'd repair you and you'd be healthy. And then some of them say, okay, well, that actually that doesn't sound so bad. Um, and then other people say, well, you know, I'll get bored. You know, what, if I were around for 200, 500 years, what would I do? And that, that kills me too, that kind of answer just kills me. Um, and now I'm sort of reverting to the, well, you know, life expectancy was 43 years in 1850 in America. You know, what if somebody had come to the people back then and say, oh, life expectancy is 43 right now, but guess what, we could double your life expectancy. What do you think? And what if they said to you, oh, no, 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 that extra, like, 40, I'd get so bored. I don't know what I would do. And that sounds ridiculous to us now because we expect to live that long and we have lots of things to do. Um, and if we could live even longer, then we could do even more things, and that would be fabulous. Yeah. And, the, and the people who tend to say that they'd be bored at the age of 200, the thing is they're already bored. That's yeah. right. That's right. And, and actually, on that point, Aubrey, I think, I think some... I think the population in general is split into optimists and pessimists, and that's just how it is. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, there's lots of bored 20-year-olds too. So, so, so uh, to ask a related question, but rather than the 30-second sec elevator pitch, um, what is your 30,000-word answer? In other words, what do you aim to achieve with this book? The, uh, well, the, the point of this book is to educate the general population as to the possibilities, the fact that it might be possible to actually extend healthy lifespan. Because uh, I don't think most people even realize that that's possible. You know, they see news hits here and there, they see the, the trachea that was grown for the man who had cancer, they see it on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, but then they forget about it. And so what I wanted to do is take all of these amazing examples, put them together in one science chapter at the beginning of the book, uh, so that people could see, wow, there's actually a strong case to be made that it might be possible to live longer and healthier. And once they realize that, then, you know, th then we could have people all over the world, all over the, the US where I live, really pushing for more support for the people who are doing this kind of work. And, and not only that, but uh, changing, changing our institutions so, so that we're ready for, for the revolution if it comes, right? I mean, of course, the interesting thing is, why do they forget about it? You know, why, when people, you know, time after time, see things on, you know, whether it's 60 Minutes or Oprah or whatever, that well, people are, are really saying, you know, we are going in the, in the foreseeable future to bring aging under medical control. Why doesn't it stay with them? Is it just the pro-aging trance? I think it's at least two things, and the pro-aging trance is a big one, because they watch it, they get excited, they see the 60 minutes, oh wow, that's awesome, then they go talk to their friends who say, oh no, no, but we all have to die sometime, right, and then, and then it's just gone. So that's, that's one reason. Another reason is that people, simply, people are busy, you know, they're busy with their lives, they're doing things, they need more time, and because they don't have enough time, they don't have time to think about uh, the things that could give them more time. Yeah, that's so true. I always think about my own work as forward planning. Yeah. Exactly, yes. <laughs> uh, well, since so, so I mentioned your book, I'm going to get you to sign one. Oh, um, I would love to do that. I, I, I have a pen. Um, um, uh, yeah, uh, four years ago, uh, um, uh, the ending agent had just come out, and we had lots of copies, and I spent a ridiculous proportion of the conference um, signing copies for, for delegates. I don't think Sonia has yet been similarly employed to the same extent. Um, uh -oh. so, uh, <laughs> I see books. <laughs> so, so, so make sure you grab, and now you know what she looks like and everything, make sure you, you, you grab her over the next 24 or 48 hours. Uh, when are you actually leaving? Are you here until Sunday? Um, unfortunately, I'm leaving soon after this chat. <laughs> I, have to, I have to go to back to New York. I, I'm on a media tour at the moment. So. Oh, you would be, yes. Okay, yes, yeah. it's exhausting. Yeah. All right, well, that, maybe you can sign a few before you, before you run yeah, out of that. I would love to. I would love to. Um, okay, so um, one other thing that I'd like to ask you about actually was brought up by Tuck in the keynote lecture a moment ago. And this is something that I certainly find is way up there among the top two or three arguments that people give for why this is a terribly um, you know, unwise quest. 
um, namely availability, that this will somehow increase inequality between the rich and the poor. And I know you addressed this question quite extensively in the book, so I'd really like to hear a few seconds of what you said. Yeah, I have an entire chapter uh, on the long, potential longevity divide. And, and actually, it exists already. When you look within the United States, there's um, a divide of about 30 years between the longest life expectancy and shortest, which is pretty significant. If you look internationally, you've got a divide of around 50 years. I mean, that's almost an entire lifetime. So we've already got a longevity divide that we don't talk about. And uh, potentially, it could get even bigger if wealthy countries get access to um, you know, regenerative medicine faster than um, poorer countries, then we could see serious tension. But when people say, well, we don't like the look of this, therefore let's not invent these therapies in the first place, what do you say? Oh yeah, well that's ridiculous. I mean, that's like saying nobody should have invented cell phones because only the rich will get them. Well, but that was true. Rich people did get cell phones first, but they were this big in a big suitcase, right? And um, because the rich, wealthy people were willing to shell out money for that, development kept going, and now a cell phone can fit in your pocket, and it's got huge computing power in it. Right, so I know it's ridiculous. You know it's ridiculous. These people know it's ridiculous. But, of course, a lot of people, when one gives them that sort of answer to, question, to that question, or to a whole bunch of other questions, really what they just do is they realize they don't have a strong re rebuttal, so they just sort of change the subject. How, yes. do, you, how do you stop... How do you, how do you stop them changing the subject? Well, you can keep talking about it. <laughs> and and you, can, you can look at numerous different technologies and how, and how actually technology is spreading quicker uh, than it ever did in the past. And, I, and I've got all those statistics in the book on that. And, um, and hopefully that trend will continue and we'll actually see that happen with things like tissue engineering. Okay, so to, um, to generalize from you to all of us, um, on that question, um, how can those of us who get it, you know, those of us who understand that aging is amenable to medical intervention and that that would be rather a good thing, how can we do better? What can we do that we're not yet doing? Or how can we do more? I would like to see more scientists, bioengineers, ex ex explaining their research in easier to understand terms. I mean, I spent a lot of time reading hardcore science papers, which you know, I can do, but it takes me a lot longer than it takes you guys. So uh, it, it would be nice to see summaries that were written in, in easier to understand terms. And I think that you, at SENS, you do a good job of communicating things and, um, you know, supporting groups like yours and, and uh, inviting people like me to your conferences, I think, is, is useful and helps get the word out. Fantastic. I think that is a perfect note on which to end this brief chat. Um, thank you so much, Sonia. Thanks. And Thanks, uh, I look forward to having you back next time. Thank you. Uh, I, 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 we probably have a couple of minutes, yeah. Anyone has any burning questions for Sonia? Okay, I've got a couple here. Let's go for LA first. Uh, where's Victor? There he is. Give, give the, oh, I've got the microphone. Okay, that won't do. Right. <laughs> go on, Melinda. Okay, okay so um, I guess the thing that's running through my mind, which we haven't touched on, is limited resource, increased population, limited geography. Right, yes, and I have, an entire, I have an entire chapter on that as well, and I, I kept thinking about it, actually, as we were watching the last presentation, um, because I'm much more optimistic on the, uh, on the environment front. It, it, it's true that as we get new technologies, uh, that oftentimes new technologies can cause new types of pollution, and that happened with the Industrial Revolution. Britain was covered in smoke. In fact, bronchitis used to be called the British disease, mm -hmm. right? Of course, it doesn't look like that anymore. And the reason it doesn't look like that anymore is because we noticed, well, people here noticed it and, uh, and didn't like it. But, and it. but it took them a while. They had to get wealthier first. And as income increases, the urge to fix the environment tends to increase too. And so you get to this point at which people are wealthy enough to decide to fix things. And then... Uh, the environment tends to get better and, and degradation goes down. And so that, and that's called a Kuznets curve for, for people who are, uh, for, this is the term that in, uh, environmental scholars use to describe that. And there's a Kuznets curve for every type of pollution. And so there's different types. And so uh, we were talking about LA pollution earlier and, and uh, 
there was a different type of pollution when we had different types of cars, and now we have new cars, and we, now we have nanoparticles, and maybe most people aren't aware of that yet. And so I think it's really great that there are people, like our last speaker, who were doing research on that and trying to point it out to people that, look, there's these 